most of my career has been spent in the telecommunications field. In fact, my entire career has been spent in the telecommunications field. So um, I've decided that uh, my, uh, my, my theme for, 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 for my year as president is going to be digital transformation. And you'll, you'll see later on why I've, I've done that. Because I believe uh, for us it is, it's going to be um, an enabler to inclusivity and we as an institute can play a, a major role in, 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 in uh, achieving that. So the title of my talk is Digital Transformation, uh, uh, an enabler for inclusivity, both at an economic level and at a, at a social level. Uh, just as an agenda for tonight, because I know that I'm standing between you and your supper, or your dinner, or snacks, so uh, you can at least see that I'm not going to kill you with, uh, with, uh, with a huge agenda. We're going to start off by basically defining what we mean by digital transformation. I'm going to look at this concept of digital disruption as well. You'll see I'll, I'll specify an ecosystem where digital disruption forms part of um, digital transformation. Uh, we're then going to look at uh, digital inflection points or digital technology inflection points, looking at particular technologies that have led to digital transformation. Then we're going to look at the benefits of uh, transformation, digital transformation. We're also going to look at the disadvantages. Unfortunately, it's not all positive stuff. Um, we're going to look at some of the challenges. And then I'm going to bring us back home. I'm then going to look at how we as an institute can contribute to the debate around digital transformation. And that would be both an, on an external platform as well as internally within, within the Institute as well. Digital transformation is not just about what happens to other people or, or driving or enabling their inclusivity. It's also something that we need to do back home. We need to also look internally. So let's have a look at what we mean by digital transformation. In very simple, in very simple terms, it's about um, the effect the changes that have occurred in the environment around us as a result of the application of digital technology. It's as simple as that. Um, and that environment around us can be anything. It can be your business environment, it can be an economic platforms, it can be your social life, it can be uh, you know, the way you, you entertain yourself or how you get entertainment. It's your entire life has been changed by the adaption or the application of digital technology. I always talk about it in, 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 in terms, today we, we, we live uh, in an analog world. And that's the interesting thing. Uh, in this very room, we have no, the, 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 um, the impact on us in terms of our senses, nothing is digital, it's all analog. So in actual fact, we live in a physical world. And digital transformation is about taking us out of that physical world into a digital world. And that's what we've been doing over the years. So just some examples, and there's millions of them, but just to maybe, maybe just give you a, a quick insight into, you know, to, to, to bring the definition home, um, you'll see that we've had some changes in, in our lives. For example, most of you around here that are my age or, or younger, slightly younger, would remember the days when you communicated in writing, literally in writing, or you typed it up on a typewriter. Um, you know, I come out of, as, as Henry pointed out in my CV, I come out of the South African Post Office. In those days, we used to write memos. And those memos would go back and forth, back and forth, and they would become piles of paper. That's how we communicated. Do we do that in, nowadays? No. Most of our communication today is done electronically through email. So that's a major change that's taken place. Love letters are now done through email. The only thing that's missing is the perfume. <laughs> Another example is, for example, buying a house or selling a house. Why I put this down is because that's the thing that me and my wife have just gone through. We sold our home because we will be relocating later this year. Uh, and, uh, and that has changed completely. In the old days, I, would, I can recall when you went and looked for a house, you would get the newspaper, you would drive around, you'd visit show houses. Nowadays, most of that research you do online. So by the time you actually go out and look at the home, you've already you know, seen a lot of the, you've shortlisted, and you've, you've taken out most of the waste, waste, time, waste time factor in terms of finding new homes. So there's hundreds of examples of, uh, of, of what digital transformation actually means.
One of the big areas where digital transformation, of course, has taken place has been in the, um, in the business environment. And that's been primarily driven by companies wanting to change the customer experience <coughs> and wanting to change that customer experience so that uh, they can strengthen their position in, in the marketplace as, you know, strengthen their com competitive position. Um, a lot of the digital transformation that's taken place in the business environment has also been driven to a certain extent by the increase in technical savvy of the customer base who are starting to demand that they get communicated with, that they interact with the businesses, that they get serviced through a digital platform rather than a, uh, rather than a physical platform. And I think the one area that really we've really seen this in has been online banking or banking. How many of you have ever, or in the last few months even, have gone into a physical bank? A lot of people don't. And it's sad because just recently Standard Bank announced that they'll actually be closing 91 branches. You probably heard in the press. Why? Because people don't visit those branches anymore. They do their banking online. Um, and that's going to result in some job losses. But that's obviously one of the uh, main drivers. One of the main drivers there is being customer demands who want to have the ease of doing banking from home any, any time of the day. In terms of a systems concept, because this is an electrical engineering presentation uh, and, and therefore I need to bring some system theory into it, this is really what, uh, what the system looks like for digital transformation. It's been driven by obviously digital technology and I'll, I'll highlight some of those technologies later on. But this digital technology can also drive digital disruption. And we're going to talk about some of that. Uh, and digital disruption then also drives digital transformation. So it's a control system that, uh, that we formulated. And that's, that's starting to drive uh, the move towards uh, digital transformation. <coughs> digital disruption is really about technology. It's where technology has changed a particular business or a particular process, or a particular manner in which a service has actually been, been uh, rolled out. That's really what uh, digital disruption is all about. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is that it's coming in a number of ways over the years. It hasn't been around that long. It's only really started around about the 1990s. And, and the main area there is where we had things like uh, <clears throat> the move from, uh, from music, uh, and video and photography moving from physical formats, DVD, <coughs> in those days it was actually tape, cassettes perhaps, maybe they just gone on to DVD, <coughs> moving that into a, into a digital uh, environment. Uh, and that created these players, and I'm going to talk about some of them in a minute. In 2000s, it, it was about, the disruption was about moving video. And also, moving services like travel and entertainment onto a digital platform. And that created the next wave of disruption in terms of changing businesses and business processes. And of course, the latest in the 2010s, which is the sort of decade that we, we're sitting in now, is where we're starting to see things affecting uh, automotive industry, finances, and healthcare. So if we look at just some of the examples, um, and I've just picked three. Uh, the first one is Netflix. Netflix today is a streaming company, yes, and it's a huge company. As you can see from the, from the figures that I've got over there, uh, in 2018, uh, they, 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 they were 100 billion rand cap, uh, market cap, and 100 billion rand market cap, and were earning about 15.8 billion a year. But very few people know that Netflix actually started off as an online DVD rental company. It was actually started by a guy called Reed Hastings, who um, received a fine, $40 fine, funny enough, for a DVD that he returned late to a rental shop. And because that upset him, he said, bugger this, I'm going to start my own operation, but I'm going to disrupt it, I'm going to do it online. And so you could actually um, order your DVDs online, and then they would be couriered to you and you obviously use the same career company to return it. And that's really how Netflix started. In 2007, uh, the amount of bandwidth available and the cost of that bandwidth be 
was such that it became economically feasible to maybe replace this physical format of, of renting out DVDs uh, through streaming. And in fact, because Netflix didn't trust the amount of bandwidth that was going to be available at that particular time, they actually created a set-top box. So the idea was that overnight you would actually trickle download a movie, or a number of movies, it doesn't matter, uh, you could download two or three movies, and then the next day you could watch them from your box. Uh, that didn't last very long because then Netflix realized that actually bandwidth was available in most countries, maybe South Africa was a bit slow, but in the States it definitely was available at that time, and therefore the set-top box didn't survive very long, and they went straight into streaming, which is where they are today. YouTube, of course, is the other uh, phenomenon that has severely disrupted specifically the video industry. Now, if you think about the video industry before YouTube, it was about a few content providers. These are guys that made content, etc. And they would send it out through linear broadcasting to the masses, to the consumers. So we as consumers consumed video. YouTube turned the thing around in that we as consumers actually created video. So we create our own stuff. We create our own entertainment. And that's really how YouTube has survived and how it's grown significantly. And you can see the, the statistics. I mean, there's 1.9 million, 1 million active users on YouTube per month. They upload 300 hours of video per minute. And there's 3 billion videos watched per day. A lot of it is total rubbish. But it doesn't matter. It's, it's entertaining. And then, of course, there's YouTube, the, the well-known one, the most recent uh, business that's been, that's been very disruptive to the industry, specifically a transport company that doesn't own one vehicle. And it's based on a very simple model. It needs a driver who's got a license and a car, a reasonable car that works. It's based on you as a user who downloads an app, and you simply use that app to book a ride, and you pay using the app as well. And uh, in terms of the revenue sharing scheme that's attached to this to this transaction, 80% of the of the revenue that, that's earned from any ride goes to the driver. Obviously, he's got the biggest investment in this in this affair, and 20% goes to Uber. That's their service fee. It's been extremely disruptive, as you know, and it carries on to be disruptive. Because it's disrupted the existing services like taxis, etc. And in some countries, it's actually led to violence. In fact, in our own country, um, Uber has led to, to, to some, some incidents of violence where the taxi industry has not been that kind to, to the introduction of this new disruptive technology and disruptive business service. Disruption has also had a number of casualties. And I think a lot of you would be aware of this particular casualty, the Kodak. I call it the Kodak casualty. Um, Kodak, I don't know how many of you would know, know this, but actually invented the digital camera. Steven Sasson, he worked for Kodak in the, in the 70s, I think it was 1975, he developed the digital camera. But their management at the time said, no, cute, but don't tell anyone about it. We're a photographic company. We sell film. And I know, I was an amateur photographer for many years, and I loved Kodak film. Kodachrome 100, Kodachrome 200. If you did wildlife photography, Kodachrome 400 for high speed. And that's how they carried on. Um, but other people didn't. Their competitors saw the, you know, the, the advantages of moving from a physical platform of doing photography, full, and having to go through developing processes, etc., moving on to digital. So their competition didn't stand still. And in 2007, they realized they made a mistake and that they have to get back into digital photography or to digital photography very, very quickly. I'm going to show you a video, a marketing video that they released at that time in a minute. But it was too late. By that stage, the, the horse had bolted, and, um, and, and Kodak gradually de deteriorated over the ensuing years. And in 2010, they had a file for bankruptcy. 
and an organization, a company that had been around for 128 years and that had been involved in some of the greatest events in mankind. For example, Kodak film was used to photograph Neil Armstrong walking on the moon. Kodak film was used during the Second World War. Uh, closed up because of management realizing that, um, or, or making a decision that they, they did not see benefits in this, in this new technology, or they felt that this new technology would, have been, would be risk to their existing business. So I'm going to come back to that point in a minute. Let's have a, a look at the, at the video. century, the Eastman Kodak Company has been part of our lives, our memories, and our futures. Continually pioneering technologies that make the process of taking pictures easier and the results remarkably better. Allowing us all to share the precious moments we treasure, the benchmarks of our lives with those we love. In fact, many of us fondly refer to those special times as Kodak moments. Kids growing up puppies playing in boxes, elderly people blowing out birthday candles, daddy's little girl becoming a blushing bride. Gets you misty, doesn't it? Yep, they shovel the schmaltz on pretty thick. But that kind of crap doesn't work anymore. People want the latest digital things, more power, more features, wireless contraptions, innovative ways to bring their pictures into the 21st century. Well, guess what, bucko? Kodak is doing it. You thought they were just hiding out, waiting for this digital thing to blow over, didn't you? Oh, sure. For a while, they were like, oh, there's no way digital's going to catch on. Yeah, well, 20 years ago, they pawned the first digital camera off on Apple, who marketed it with all the grace of an anaconda devouring a live chicken. Eh, only it'd come in more colors. But now, Kodak is back. They're taking this digital thing to a level undreamed of. Pioneering technology that'll redefine the digital revolution. I know, big talk coming from the company that unleashed it. Fandex onto the world, right? Well, turn down your mini-disc player, fire up your Newtons, and listen up, because they're not playing grab ass anymore. They've got things in their research labs that'll make biometrics look like a Happy Meal toy. I'm talking facial recognition, GPS-enabled photography so my camera knows where it is, pictures that learn and group themselves into stories. We're talking meta-knowledge. Cameras that automatically enhance the color of the grass because they know it's grass. Try and patent that. Oh, too late. <laughs> and what about sharing? I'll tell you about sharing. All your friends and family will be emailing their pictures wirelessly to you and sending pictures of grandma's birthday to your phone and uploading shots of the dog wearing those big stupid sunglasses to your PDA. And they're going to be everywhere because now you won't have to be a Navajo code breaker to use digital. And they're all going to look like freaking Andy Leibowitz shot them because they'll automatically adjust the lighting and the composition for you. No more flash problems, no more red eye. How's that for advanced? Booyah! You know what the best part is? They're going to turn the schmaltz back up to 11. Oh, yes. People will have their Kodak moments again. They're going to bring back all those damn pictures of the cute puppies and the cuddly kittens and the cooing babies and old folks in party hats and dads crying and the, the doe-eyed kid. You know the one. They're bringing them all back, all in the same spot. And it's going to be 15 minutes long, and James Cameron will direct it, and Celine Dion will sing the theme song while riding along on a unicorn through a field of baby animals under a big blue sky. And there's not a damn thing you can do to stop it. You were a Kodak moment once, and by God, you'll be one again. Only this time, it's digital. Oh, yeah! <laughs> and the other one, of course, has been mentioned. Michelin's a tower company, but they realized if they carried on providing tower tires only, you know, with the likes of Dunlop and, and hundreds of other players that are entering the tire market, they were, they were running risk. So they decided to move their platform, stay in market in, in tires, but providing entire ecosystem. So they actually provide a management system around tire, tire management, whereby they can actually um, guarantee 
performance of the tires. And that took them to a different competitive level in, in, the, in the market. So those are just examples of companies that went back and actually cannibalized their own products to survive. Not all products can be cannibalized or should be cannibalized. Let's have a look at this video. Am I... continued to survive and we still have books today the one area that's taken a big knock as a result of the digital platform move towards digital transformation has been the print media in terms of newspapers and magazines you can see the market 65 billion or just over 65 billion dollars in 2010 uh, in 2000 that dropped to 17 billion in 2013 so it was a significant influence uh, on the on the newspaper market The next thing that I'd like to look at is the, the technologies, and these are technology, uh, uh, digital technology inflection points that have, that have resulted in the drive or the move towards digital transformation. Now, I'd like to point out right from the start that these are technologies that I believe have had a significant influence on digital transformation. They might not be technologies that you believe. And what I've done is, and I'm going to run through them in detail later on, but I've separated them into three areas. The one is obviously certain technologies that have occurred in, sorry, in telecommunications, uh, and I'll run through them. Obviously electronics, electronics, the, the, the technologies that have come out in, in, in electronics have driven telecommunications as well as computation, as well as the computer industry. And then of course, what has happened in the computer side, what's happening in the computer world. And, and, and these all combined together have had a significant contribution to uh, digital transformation. So let's, um, let's have a look at some of them in detail. The first one, of course, is the invention of pulse code modulation. Pulse code modulation is the first time uh, we, we took an analog signal, sampled it, converted it into a digital signal, and used that to transport information across an interface. Okay? Um, it's based on the nicholas Salvi theorem. Those of you who have done uh, communication theory would know the nicholas sample theorem says if you want to sample a particular signal and you want to reconstruct that sampled signal on the receive side, you need to sample at twice the highest frequency component. In the so that's what nicholas said. The interesting thing about pulse code modulation was that it was actually invented in 1937. And it was invented by a man called Alex Reeves, who uh, we know pretty well. Uh, Alec Reeves uh, delivered the Bernard Price Memorial Lecture, this very institute, 1969. Uh, Mike Crouch would uh, know Alec, Alec uh, pretty well because uh, Alec worked for the company that Mike worked for uh, for many years. And the problem was that although Alec Reeves invented pulse code modulation in 1937, the technology was not around to economically apply it, or to be able to economically deliver pulse code modulation as an economic solution. And the reason for that is because at that particular point in time we had valve technology, we didn't have transistors. It wasn't until transistors were invented, and I'll come to that later on, but they were invented in 1947, that it became feasible to look at using pulse code modulation as an economic and commercial solution in terms of providing digital, trans uh, digital transmission. The other significant contribution from a telecommunications point of view to digital transformation has been the invention of optical fiber. Or at least the invention or the use of optical fiber as a transmission media. There was a lot of work done on optical fiber before, but it wasn't until the mid-60s 
that two gentlemen, Charles Kai and George Hartman, also uh, coming from, funny enough, SDC, Standard Telephone and Cables in the UK, uh, looked at what is required to use optical fibers to carry high-speed data. And the requirement at that particular point in time was to reduce the attenuation to below 20 dBs per kilometer. And the only way that they could do that was to actually improve the purity of the silicon that they used. So what they proposed is particular doping techniques, uh, whereby the actual silica is doped with additional materials like germanium, etc., in order to drop the uh, attenuation. In fact, the improvements have been so significant that today we have fibers that, uh, that uh, provide uh, attenuation of 0 0.05 dBs per kilometer. So that's been the second significant contribution to digital transformation. The third one, of course, was the invention of Ethernet, 1973, by a guy called Bob Metcalf and his colleague, David Box. They worked for Xerox. And at that particular time, they needed a solution to be able to connect computer devices. In fact, what was happening then is they were transferring information between devices and between machines using disks, which was a stupid idea. And so they came up with Ethernet, which is basically a, a local area network protocol. It wasn't commercialized until the 1980s, uh, when uh, Bob Metcalf started 3Com. And in fact, uh, in order to commemorate the invention of Ethernet and its significant contribution to digital transformation, because today Ethernet forms the foundation layer one and layer two connectivity technology for the internet and for all IP connectivity, in order to commemorate that, I've invited Bob Metcalf, who's still alive, still active, uh, as a professor at the University, of, the University of Texas, he will be presenting our Bernard Price Memorial Lecture later this year. And then moving forward, there are a couple of technologies that are going to change and make a significant contribution to digital transformation. The one is of course, my area of expertise, which is software-centric networks. Very simply put, this is about taking networks that we build today in physical format, because that's what we do. We build networks using boxes, lots of boxes, and all these boxes